Hi, and welcome to uh, Keeping Up With Intro to Data Science. We're in week four of the course. So last week was all about um, data wrangling and data tidying, where we worked with a single data frame and we manipulated the data in there. And then we talked about joining data from multiple sources. And we ended the week uh, with talking about pivoting data, where we go from wide to long or long to wide format, which is basically what you needed to apply as part of your lab on Friday. Um, and then once you uh, reshape the data from wide to long, uh, you could then use what you learned the previous week in terms of data visualization to create a line plot. There were a few things that came up uh, over and over in the questions over the last week. So I want to first go over uh, a couple of these before we move on to talking about this week's material. OK, so the first example comes from the plastic waste data that you had as part of your previous lab assignment, where what we asked you as part of the last exercise in that assignment was to filter the data to uh, emit a couple of the large outliers and then plot that. And we ask you to do that in a single pipeline. And there were a couple things that um, came up to be uh, common uh, mistakes or errors that people were running into. One of them was um, many of you had the filtering part right, so up until the filtering right, but then what we needed to do was to filter that, uh, that uh, pipe that filtered data frame into the ggplot call. But I've seen a lot of code where in that same pipeline, many of you were um, specifying the data frame again. So what happens here is that in the first three lines, we are starting with a plastic waste data frame and then we're creating the new variable, which is the coastal population proportion portion, then filtering the data for where plastic waste per capita is less than three. But then we're piping that into a, a, a ggplot call where we once again are giving it a, a data argument, which is the plastic way. So obviously that's not going to work because one, even if it did work, you would be plotting the full data set as opposed to the filtered data set. But number two, what's happening right now is that what's coming from the previous pipeline is clashing with what you have defined as a data set uh, in the ggplot call as well. So then you get an error that's along the lines of this. Mapping should be created with uh, AES or AES underscore. So basically saying that you should be doing mapping with, with aesthetics. And you might be thinking, well, I have my aesthetic mappings in there. Why am I getting this error? The reason for that is that we get the data frame from the first three lines of this code already piped into the ggplot code. So that's already there, the filtered data frame. So now that highlighted plastic waste argument uh, appears to ggplot too, as that is the aesthetic mapping. And it's just saying, no, I am expecting an aesthetic mapping here, but now you've basically shifted your code over and uh, you're running into this issue. Is the error very informative? Mm, yes and no. Maybe in hindsight, now that I've said this, you're thinking, okay, I get why that's happening. But I do acknowledge that when you first run into that error, um, it would be nice if it said something like, hey, you already passed a data frame to me. Why did you specify it again? But that level of understanding what you did would require a lot of cognition on ggplot2's part. And that's obviously not happening. Another common error was... <coughs> forgetting to put the pipe operator at the end of the third line. So uh, many of you have filtered the data properly, and then you have your ggplot call, but you don't have your pipe data in there. And when you have this, the error basically says that you need uh, data must be a data frame or something else. Um, and then it says, did you accidentally pass the AES, so the aesthetic mappings, to the data argument? And you might be thinking, no, I got my data. It's coming from the pipeline, and I'm passing it on to the ggplot call. But actually, you're not, because that highlighted area is where your pipe operator is missing. So if we were to put that pipe operator back in there, then we would get the right result that's intended. And the reason for the error that you're seeing is that right now, because no data set is being passed into ggplot, it is thinking that the first thing that you've provided to it, which is the aesthetic mappings, must be the data. And that's why it says, did you accidentally pass the aesthetic mappings to the data argument? Um, and so if you add the pipe operator where it's missing in this code chunk, then we would get the data being passed on properly, and then the rest of it should work fine. 
Um, another thing that came up, this wasn't so much an error, but a question that came up a few times was how to use different aesthetics for different geoms. So when we define the aesthetic mappings in our ggplot call, so here that's on the fourth line of our code, when we map it that way, uh, when we define it that way, it gets passed on to all the geoms that come after it. So right now in this code that we're seeing in the ggplot call, we're saying X is coastal population proportion and Y is the plastic waste per capita. So for both geom point and geom smooth, that X and Y mapping is being used. And that's kind of what you expect it to happen. But the plot that you were asked to recreate had uh, points colored by different continents, but the smooth line was for was a single smooth line, not per continent. So what we've done here is that we've said the X and Y aesthetics should be passed on at the top level so they can be used both for geom point and for geom smooth, but the color should only be used for the points and not for the smooth line. So over here, the plot that you needed to recreate required that you have a single smooth line and that single smooth line you can achieve by basically not passing the color um, aesthetic. So instead of telling geom smooth ignore color, what we're saying is that both point and smooth should inherit the aesthetic mappings from the top level, but point in addition to it should have a color aesthetic, but geom smooth should not. So you can mass, uh, you can this way construct uh, different aesthetics for different geoms. So at different layers of your plot, you can have that. You can actually go one step further and plot different data sets in different geoms and different layers as well. Obviously, if these data sets have nothing to do with each other, that's just going to look very wonky. But as long as there is something happening there in terms of maybe you're uh, passing a part of the same data set um, in one of your layers and the other part in the other layer, you can actually build your plots up in that way as well. And coming on to this week, uh, this week we're going to be working on data importing and data recoding. Um, your lab two, which is what you started on Friday with your teams this time, uh, is due on Tuesday at 4 p.m. Your homework, which you're working on individually, um, is going to be due on Thursday at 4 p.m. And note that on Tuesday and on Wednesday, myself and David have uh, student hours that you can attend in addition to asking questions on Piazza. And this weekend, we're actually going to be asking you to do your first peer evaluation. I know that you've been working with your teams for just two weeks at that point, but the reason why we want to do that is just to make sure that we have everyone showing up, everybody is in communication, especially with the course being uh, taught online and and uh, some of you being geographically scattered all over the world with different time zones, we want to make sure that we can intervene as early as possible if certain members of the team are missing and address that. It is also going to be an opportunity for you to, to uh, discuss with your teammates um, your what are the things that you want to stick to your principles in terms of communication and workflow. So all of that, the peer evaluation should get you thinking about all of this so that in the following week, you can talk to your teammates about it as well. As usual, we have our weekly quiz due on Sunday that you're filling in online. You are welcome to do it at any point during the week. It's just due by uh, midnight on Sunday. And next week is going to be your uh, project proposal, which I'm going to say a few more words about by the end of this video. So. In terms of this week, in addition to the content that we're going to be covering on data importing and recoding, a few other things that you're going to uh, be learning about. We want you to get more comfortable with data pipeline. So uh, while we're covering a couple new topics, we're going to be building on what you've learned in terms of working with dplyr and tidyr for building data pipelines and oftentimes ending that with a visualization at the end as well. In addition, we're going to start learning about R as a programming language. And the reason why I'm saying this is that we are actually going to be uh, talking about things like data types, how R handles data when it first imports it. 
Uh, we're also going to learn to deal with Git merge conflicts, which some of you have already gotten yourselves into when you were working with your teams um, over the last week. And uh, we said at the beginning of the workshop last week that if you don't follow the instructions precisely, you might run into issues. And you might have been thinking, this is too precise a set of instructions to have to follow. And I absolutely agree with you. That is not how human nature works. People don't just put their hands in their pockets and wait for their teammate to push. We are all wanting to be working on things at the same time. So what Git allows us to do is to do that in a principled way when there are two people working on the same uh, repository and making changes to the same areas of a document, it creates what we call a merge conflict and it asks you as the human to resolve that merge conflict. So this week's workshop is going to have you work a little bit on resolving more uh, merge conflicts which that skill is going to stick with you throughout the semester as you're working on both your uh, labs and also your project. And finally, we want you to start th thinking about your project. So your project is one where you pick a data set and you do something with it. Anything we've learned in the course, and right now we are not even halfway through the course. We're very close to it, if you can believe it, but we're not even there just yet. So for your project proposal, which is due next Friday, what I'm going to be asking you to do is to pick a data set and start thinking about what questions you might want to explore. Um, you're going to put in a project proposal, which we evaluate and then give you extensive feedback on. This feedback will say things like, um, yes, this seems feasible. Maybe you don't know how to do this just yet, but you will learn these techniques by the end of the semester. Or maybe you pitch an idea and we say, actually, the technique that you would need to be able to answer this question in a principled way is not something we're going to cover in this course. So we recommend shifting your focus this way. Your project proposal does become a part of your grade, but what we're going to be looking for is really what I call completeness and honesty, as opposed to just like, did you actually hit the nail in, on the head in terms of exactly what you're going to be working on on your project? You're also going to have an opportunity to shift things or change things as you go, but it is an opportunity for you to start thinking about it and also getting some idea about what is going to be feasible for you to do with your team by the end of the semester. Um, a few other miscellaneous announcements. So I have added new information on the course website uh, based on information we've received from the school and the university uh, for new guidance on late work, extensions, and special circumstances. I'm not going to reiterate all of that here in this video, but in my weekly email, I'll uh, point you to the precise text where this information has been added so that you can read through that. And then if you have any questions, obviously I'm happy to clarify that for you. Um, in terms of teamwork, you've just started your teamwork and some of you are doing really well with your teams and others might be thinking, well, one of my teammates did not show up. How is this going to work out? Is this the end of the world? And hopefully it's not. Um, and so I wanted to outline a few things in terms of how we expect you to communicate, what your expectations are and what, what the policies are in the course. So in terms of communication, we've set up team spaces. So that's on Microsoft team spaces for each of the teams. You can choose to use the space or you don't have to. It's entirely up to you. You can hop on there. Each of you in your team has access to it. You can push the button and start a video call if you want. You can share your screen. You can do whatever you like. But if you choose to keep your communication outside of that on WhatsApp, WeChat, whatever you want, that's perfectly fine by me as well with one very important rule. Every single member of the team must be included in that conversation. Now, friendships are different. You might have different conversations with different parts of your team. That's fine. But when you're talking about the work that needs to be accomplished as a team, you should either use the channel we've provided for you where we have ensured that every single team member is on there, or if you want to use an alternative method, then you have to make sure that every team member is on there as well. Um, the expectation is that you work, start working in your uh, labs on Fridays together during the workshop. That's when you can get live help on them as well. Um, and then you need to keep working on it probably a little bit longer, maybe over the weekend, maybe on Monday or Tuesday so that you can hit the Tuesday deadline. We expect you to get through a substantial chunk of the work on Friday, but not necessarily finish it. Therefore, 
I would very strongly recommend that you set a weekly meeting time with your team now, as opposed to trying to ad hoc uh, find a time to meet on a weekly basis uh, when you need to do work. If some week you actually finish everything you need to do during the workshop and there's no reason at all to meet with your team uh, between Friday and Tuesday and you want to cancel it, that's fine. No, people love canceled meetings. People don't live, love added meetings. So put the weekly meeting on your calendars now and then you can actually uh, choose to either hold that meeting or decide you don't need it on a weekly basis. Um, you should also communicate with each other in terms of who is doing what. At some point, you may need to, you know, split some of the work apart and then bring it back together. But I would recommend as much as possible concurrently working on it because those exercises are designed in a way where you learn more from them if you're actually talking through them with your teammates. In terms of policies, if someone, if a team member has not committed at all to a particular team assignment, then they get a zero on that team assignment. So each, every single person has to have at least one commit for a team assignment. Now, a commit does not always mean quality contribution. Um, therefore, we have the peer evaluations where we actually then have you articulate how the teamwork has been going, and then we can help you uh, kind of get that uh, workflow to be better if need be with meeting with your team and myself to talk through your process. Um, so that f things feel like it's an enjoyable experience where you're learning from each other and it is fair as well. The work isn't uh, falling on the shoulders of just one or two people. At the same time, lack of any commits does mean something. It means a particular team member has not engaged at all and therefore they, get, they don't get the points for that lab um, assignment uh, for themselves. Remember that we dropped the lowest lab score. So it is possible that one week one team member is out and they, they decide they're not going to be able to contribute. That's their own choosing. What I uh, strongly urge you to do is then to communicate with your teammates if that's going to be you and just say, hey everyone, I'm out this week. So-and-so is happening. Or maybe you don't even uh, discuss the reason why and just say, I can't make it and I won't be able to contribute. I'm going to take this one as my dropped score you all work on this. If a particular team member is doing this over and over, this will come up in the peer evaluations and then we as the course staff can intervene and figure out what the best workflow can be for your team. Um, asking for help. So in these uh, channels with your teams, we have also added your tutors and myself to them as well. We're not going to be listening in on your conversations. You can use that space to ask questions to your tutors uh, during the workshop. That's perfectly fine. And at that time, you should expect almost immediate response, barring that they might be talking to another team at the time and then they'll hop in and chat with you. Outside of the workshop, you're also welcome to ask them questions there, but you should not expect um, immediate response since they're not going to be just watching that space constantly. My recommendation, instead of asking there, make your question more general and actually post on Piazza. But especially when we start working on our projects, you might have more uh, kind of custom tailored questions that you need to get answered. And that might be the right place to pose that question, but you're going to have to be patient with their workflow. Uh, you may not necessarily get a response right away. As usual, um, the best way to get answers on the spot is to attend the student hours because during that time you ask a question you get your answer on the spot and the code along sessions are good for that as well as well as the workshop so take advantage of the live events happening in the course as opposed to just posting somewhere and then waiting around for an answer um, finally, addressing course staff. So I will start with myself. I've said at the very beginning of the class that you can call me Dr. Chittinkaya Rundell. You can call me Mina by my first name if you like, or you can just call me Professor. If you can't, if you don't feel like pronouncing my name or my last name, Professor is the way to go, not Miss not misses. It's important that you refer to people with how they choose to be referred to. Um, so you can, if you want to keep things sounding a bit more professional, professor is perfectly fine or Dr. Chetinkaya Randall. I myself am telling you that if you were to call me Mina, I'm not offended by it. You should 
before you call another uh, instructor or professor uh, with their first name, make sure that they are okay with that as well. Otherwise, professor is a good baseline. And similarly with uh, our course tutors, some of them are actually staff in the school, some of them are postgraduate students. Either way, you can refer to them by their first name, um, but not Miss or Mrs. or Mr. Um, or if they've chosen that you refer to them a different way, you should go ahead and uh, do that as opposed to just making assumptions about what other titles their name might come with. Well, I hope you enjoy fourth week of the course and I'll see all of you during the live sessions of the week. Um, and hopefully um, things are going well. And if they're not, please don't hesitate to ask questions on Piazza or reach out to me. Have a good week.